Autopsy doctors of Reddit. What was the biggest revelation you had to a person's death after you carried out the procedure? Assisted with a post-mortem when I was a student. Female patient died in her 40s. Her medical history had extensive complaints of abdominal pains. One doctor even referred to her as a hypochondriac, and others commented on apparent anxiety. Opened her abdomen and she had extensive scar tissue. She was absolutely massacred inside from endometriosis. She suffered for decades and never got referred for a laparoscopy. She didn't have freaking anxiety. She had a medical condition. I have heard this is incredibly common in endometriosis. Thankfully, I also hear it's getting better, but seriously, doctors, just start taking women's abdominal pain more seriously, please. No, it's possible it isn't just period cramps. Anyway, moving on. Story 2. Not mine, but a doctor I used to work with. Back when I was in school, he would do his cadaver labs really late at night. Too many people during the day. One time, it was really late, around 2am. He was listening to his lecture on his headphones, and he saw the cadaver's arm move slash twitch. Thought it was just his mind playing tricks on him, then he saw it again. Proceeded to run away in a panic. He told a few of his classmates what happened, but nobody believed him. Next day, they did a group cadaver lab with the same cadaver. The arm twitched yet again. The professor did some digging, and it turns out the patient's pacemaker was still fully functional and occasionally fired, causing the arm to twitch. He was so relieved, he thought there was a zombie in there. Story 3. I may be late to the party, but I finally have a good story to tell. In medical school, my group's cadaver was an 80-plus-year-old female who was uh, extremely unfit. Morbidly obese with muscles half the size of any other cadavers. Her pectoral muscles were paper-thin to get some reference. We figured she was bedridden during her last few months, which would somewhat explain these findings. When we started our neurology unit and began to dissect the infratemporal fossa, I discovered a small metal pellet under the skin behind her right ear. My tank mates and I went on to find dozens of these metal pellets strewn around her head's anatomy, with some lodged into the cranium and others into the bones of her face. We contacted her living relatives to get some clarification, and they ended up revealing that when this lady and her brother were children, they said she was eight years old, they were playing with an old decorative rifle that the family had mounted above their fireplace. Long story short, the brother accidentally discharged the rifle into the girl's face. The aftermath was this lady was blind and wheelchair bound for the rest of her life and the pellets weren't all removed. It was an interesting dissection with that information from then on, but a sobering moment in reminding our class that our cadavers are humans with their own struggles and rich lives. If you're considering donating your body to science, please know we don't take the responsibility lightly, and a million thanks aren't enough. Donating my body to science? Never thought about it. I registered as an organ donor, which, by the way, if you haven't done that yet and you want to, go ahead and do it. Just take the time, pause the video. Okay, plug's done, moving on. But yeah, I've never thought about donating my body to science. That could be interesting. I don't have any qualms about that. That is brutal, though, to get shot in the face at eight years old by your presumably eight or ten or some year old brother. Like, who's gonna stop that other than the adults? And if they don't, then you just live the rest of your life like that. That's awful. Story 4. While in med school, we had to observe an autopsy and could assist. One of the lectures was to observe for head trauma. You do this by hitting the skull with a hard object, scissor or the like. A hollow sound is normal, but a dull sound indicates trauma. One of the other students did this exam and found a dull sound. The coroner himself had not yet examined the person and was very surprised, as he was not informed by the police of head trauma. They then continued to examine the head and they found a gunshot wound through the skull. All of a sudden, the person was a crime scene and they had to call the police again and leave the person as untouched as possible. I believe it was later confirmed that the person had shot himself, but it could have been a murder. Story 5. Masters in Forensic Pathology here. You'd be surprised to know the number of people that have life-threatening issues that never were diagnosed and they didn't even die from them. Seen an older guy who died of pneumonia in the hospital. On autopsy, the guy had both an enlarged heart and a couple of medium-sized aneurysms in the brain. Another guy in his 70s apparently came into the ER and had chest pain and then died shortly after. Died of a heart attack, but also had cancer. In less natural circumstances, though, saw a guy who had been shot in the head a couple of times. Three definite entries and a blown-out skull, but police only found one bullet. Couldn't find the other bullet in his head at all. Assumed the police missed it. Went on as normal with the autopsy until we got to the chest cavity. The other bullet was just chilling beside his lung. Turns out it entered the skull, hit the inside, ricocheted down his neck and into the chest. That was pretty wild. You know how some people survive gunshot wounds to the head and it's just a miraculous thing? This is the opposite of that. For every person who is like, oh, if it was a half an inch to the left, you would have died. There's this guy who's like, yeah, you stood no chance. You were dead like three times over. It was bouncing around in there. It ended up next to your lung. It was over. Story 6. 
My wife is a pathologist assistant, and during her schooling carried out the autopsy of a newborn that died minutes after birth. The mother was desperate for a child and had a history of multiple miscarriages at different terms. This was her first time making it full term, and all prenatal checkups revealed no problems. The delivery was difficult but successful, and the baby was alive for a short time. Skip to autopsy. All signs point to baby being fully developed. Get to the abdominal cavity, and the liver is lacerated and hemorrhage everywhere. During the difficult to delivery, the residents used too much force with the forceps to pull the baby out. The ruptured liver caused the baby to bleed out internally. Wife was enthusiastic about autopsy up to this point, and now has no interest. I... I am nearly in tears. I... I don't know what else to say. What a horrible, unfortunate the situation for this poor woman. Those doctors are probably going to be more careful in the future, I'd bet. Or at least I would hope. Story 7. Not exactly an autopsy per se, but it was a patient found unresponsive with CPR in progress by EMS. The man was clearly homeless based on his appearance and smell. He had reportedly not been seen for several days by his friends and was eventually found behind a fast food restaurant dumpster. We were able to briefly get a pulse back, and when the nurse cut his pants off to place a catheter, we saw the cause. He had fashioned some sort of makeshift dong ring out of the neck of a plastic bottle. It was way too tight and completely cut off the circulation. The dong was fully black and necrotic. I did a bedside ultrasound and found his abdomen full of free fluid, which is bad. Most likely his bladder had ruptured from being unable to urinate for days. His labs suggested he was in septic shock and full-blown renal failure as well. He did not survive much longer than that. Story 8. Sheep Farmer I have to know how to do a necropsy for when something dies to know if it's something that could spread. Had an ewe fall over dead after losing a ton of weight and after treating her for everything under the sun. She would gasp for air and struggled to breathe, but antibiotics, steroids, and anti-inflammatory drugs didn't touch it. She finally passed away and I cut her open to see what the hell happened, fully expecting to see her lungs riddled with stuff. Her heart was five times the normal size and hard as a river stone. My guess is she'd had the issue her whole life and it didn't unalive her until she was two. Story 9. In college, I took a figure drawing class, and the teacher was adamant that you couldn't draw the figure if you didn't know what was in it. So he drug us over to the anatomy lab and had the anatomy teacher show us two cadavers that were being dissected by their med students. When it came time to ask questions, of course, have you ever found something weird? It came up. The story is as follows. They get a body, and for legal reasons, they aren't told much about the person aside from medical history. They were told that the old man was sort of a rock star type and a one-hit wonder from his youth, and to use extra discretion with him in particular, slash not tell the students who might recognize him. The lab is full of 20-year-olds, so nobody knew. Unsure if the teacher even knew, but it didn't sound like she did. They wrote it off as non-useful information aside from his lifestyle. He had drug use and alcohol use in his life, and they were told he partied a lot. Cool. The body has a raging hard on like a hundred percent of the time. Teacher doesn't think much of it aside from that he was particularly endowed and everyone wrote it off as not important to their studies. So they go through the general dissection that they do. One kid wants extra credit and the teacher said, sure, dissect his dong and see why it's still hard. Then you can write a report. Apparently they don't normally do that kind of stuff for the particular class. So the dong itself would go untouched from their dissections. And as such would always be a mystery. Kid finds an actual rod that he had medically inserted under the table, not in medical records. Also he could always have a heart on and get it up while on drugs. They suspect it was done over 30 to 40 years prior to his death. They removed it and kept it in the lab, I believe to show their students as part of a section on under-the-table medical surgeries. Anyway, that was probably the best day in figure drawing class I've ever had. Wow. Guy really took party hard to heart. Story 10. I'm a pre-med student and one time while shadowing a forensic pathologist, three days before Christmas, he was doing an autopsy on an automobile versus pedestrian accident. The man's face was completely smashed in. When they take samples of the brain, they cut the skin, pull it over the face, and then cut off the top of the skull. When they did that, the skull was basically shattered, and bone fragments pulled back with the skin, and when they cut off the skull cap, the brain was obviously damaged, and the eyeballs had been pushed back slash fallen through the orbits and into the cranial cavity. The guy also had $10,000 in cash in his jean pockets. According to police, he had a record involving drugs, so the theory was either a drug deal gone bad or he stumbled into the road while under the influence. Story 11. Worked at an animal hospital. They did necropsies for zoos all the time. An alligator died and they shipped it to the hospital, refrigerated, etc. to stop the decay. They took it out and put it up on the table. After doing all the paperwork, they started opening up the gator. After the first cut, the alligator opened its eyes. Turns out it wasn't dead. The zoo vet mistook an illness for death, and the low temperature put it basically into a coma. I think this would somehow be scarier than if you were operating on someone like a person who happened to be alive. Like, that would be more tragic, obviously. 
but I would fear for my life if a gator opened its eyes as I cut into it, because it's not like you sedated it because you thought it was dead. OP didn't write anymore, so I have to assume the story didn't end in tragedy, but still. Story 12. During my internship rotation a couple of years back, a 40-year-old guy came in because he suddenly collapsed while drinking with friends. He came in unresponsive, mouth bleeding, and not breathing, so we had to intubate him. For some reason, the endotracheal tube, the stiff tube placed inside the trachea to help the patient breathe, won't go in, but we managed to suction copious amounts of blood clots. After CPR, still with unsuccessful intubation, so we had to bag him with a face mask, the patient was declared dead, and diagnosed with a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. During the autopsy, they found out that the guy was apparently shot by a gun from the top of the head. The entry wound was obscured by his hair and was barely bleeding at all. The bullet somehow went through the back of the guy's throat and made a hole behind the base of the tongue, which the endotracheal tube kept slipping into. Story 13. Medical examiner here. This probably isn't a big wow revelation, but it certainly made an impact on me. Very early in my career, I did an exam on another doctor who worked at the hospital where I trained. I didn't know this gentleman personally, but was acquainted with him by reputation. He was a very happy-go-lucky sort, much loved by everyone in his department. He died unexpectedly at a young age of what turned out to be a drug overdose on pharmaceuticals he had been diverting from the hospital. I don't think anyone saw that coming, myself included. It was a lesson to me that anyone can fall victim to addiction. It's hard to know what anybody's private struggles are. Story 14. Not an autopsy doctor, but did take anatomy and physiology too with the lab in college. The lab was working on cadavers being prosected by more advanced students. A prosection is the dissection of a cadaver, human or animal or part of a cadaver, by an experienced anatomist in order to demonstrate for students anatomic structure. Anyway, one of the cadavers, we had a male and a female for obvious reasons, was a big old linebacker looking dude. Like a, an old bodybuilder type. If I recall, his age at the time of death was late 50s. His heart has been removed by the anatomist, and we were examining it because it was very enlarged and contributed to his death. We all had to hold it in our hands to feel the heft, like size and weight and compare it to the heft of the female's heart, which was normal sized, about like a large apple. The male's heart, for comparison, was the size of a small cantaloupe. I went first for whatever reason, and the instructor lifted the enlarged heart out of its preservative bath and placed it in my hands. I damn near dropped the thing when it shocked me with what felt like a jolt of electricity. I, understandably, I think, made a startled noise, and the instructor took the heart back before I could juggle it onto the floor. Oh, she said, I forgot to warn you, look out for the pacemaker. Apparently, when someone has a pacemaker, there's a battery too, and they don't bother taking it out or off. They just snip the leads and leave it there. So if you touch both bare leads, you get a mild shock, even through your exam gloves. That was a mildly disturbing experience. Story 15. I'm a former police officer and attended several autopsies to record info for investigation files. One guy had been shot and unalived, so the cause of death was, well, pretty plain. But the pathologists doing the autopsy found a tumor the size of a walnut on his brain stem. He said the guy would have been dead in a few months even if he hadn't been shot. Another guy was dead due to a steak knife being stabbed through his heart by his wife. She claimed she grabbed the knife because she was scared he was going to unalive her, and when he lunged at her, the knife just went in. When the doctor pointed out a half dozen or so marks that looked like freckles around the wound, he swabbed a developer solution that clearly showed that they were tiny little poke marks. I was then able to get her to confess that he was goading her, go ahead, do it, until she hauled off and kebobbed him. It's not always like TV shows where the autopsy is like the aha moment that solves a case, but sometimes it really is. Story 16. I was a forensic tech for a state medical examiner's office for about two years. I've assisted in about a thousand autopsies, and have removed bodies from scenes from likely twice that. I told these stories in another thread about people who clean up crime scenes, and I have a few takeaways. 1. Man who had a psychotic break and castrated himself and stuffed it all into his mouth before cutting his own throat. 2. Man who is sodomized to death with a broom, a baseball bat, and the tuning end of a guitar. 3. Man who decapitated himself by hanging himself with high-tension cable and jumping off a bridge. 4. Woman overdosing whilst carrying an 8-month pregnancy. No real major revelations, like in terms of something wild or unexpected or a medical finding that contradicts the police report, just seen enough stuff in one lifetime for a hundred people. OP, it takes really tough people to do what you do. So huge props, I know I couldn't fill your shoes. It can't be easy. Story 17. I'm a medical student, not a doctor, but when I dissected my cadaver in my first year, it had lots of surgical markings and was pretty overweight. After I'd been able to work through all the parts of the body with my group, we were able to piece together with our lab leader that our donor had been in and out of the hospital for a quadruple bypass. 
followed by a pacemaker, a stomach stapling, and then what looked like an emergency open-heart surgery that she died during. Not a rare disease or strange occurrence, per se, but was interesting finding clues about the body as we learned anatomy. Story 18. Med student almost graduated here. A couple years ago, I attended the pathological anatomy course, and during a class, the professor showed us some autopsies. Despite the tremendous smell of four or five consecutive autopsies, one autopsy was carried out on a homeless person that died in the ER, probably due to heart failure. The body had massive ascites, fluid in the abdomen, so at first he had to evacuate it. Imagine him cutting the abdomen and the yellow, rancid liquid start to come out like a fountain. One of my colleagues fainted. Then the next step was to examine the abdominal organs. Imagine the face of every person in the room when it became clear that the patient had some form of inherited polycystic disease, and the liver and kidneys were full of cysts. The liver weighed more than 10 kg, normal weight 2 to 3, and the kidneys almost 3 kg each, normally 150 grams each. The professor was really shocked at the beginning, but then he really enjoyed cutting through the cysts in order to get samples. They popped like air balls spreading liquid all over the place. Second colleague fainted. The other ones were pretty standard, but I think I will remember this one forever. In particular, that liver on the scale. Story 19. My dad did autopsies as a night job while he went to college during the day. He said the hardest ones were the children. He did an autopsy on a six-month-old, whose mother suffered from postpartum, and she told the cops that voices were telling her to put her son in the bathtub. She ran near boiling water and held him under. He said when he got to the hospital, chunks of skin were falling off and organs were liquid on the table. The other one he talks about are the people who are subjects of murder and they're buried. The decomposition process needs oxygen to break down cells, and when they're buried, it takes them a lot longer to decompose. When cops find bodies, they unearth them, and it takes a matter of hours for the bodies to decompose drastically. The smell of one particular individual that was murdered and buried in a cornfield for six weeks could be smelled from three floors above the operating room, and it was so bad it was making patients and nurses sick. Alright, these last couple have been really gross ones and just disturbing ones. It was going so well and so interesting for a bit, but now it's just, ugh. We're gonna do one more, let's see how this one goes. Story 20. Former homicide detective here. Suspicious death. 30-ish male found alone by cleaning staff in the back row of a sparsely attended sci-fi movie. Strange scratching wounds around slash in the mouth. Some petechia in eyes and on cheeks, but no signs of strangulation. No obvious signs of chronic illness or disease. Presented as healthy, normal adult male. Found on his person was a wallet with normal contents and a single cancelled movie ticket, indicating he went alone. Weird spy movie type stuff going on here. Autopsy. A large amount of popcorn compacted in his esophagus, like half a cup. Dude was apparently excited by the movie, stuffing popcorn into his mouth and choked. The scratch marks around Slash in his mouth were self-inflicted trying to dig out the popcorn, verified via fingernail scrapings. His was only DNA present. Loud movie and he was in the back. No one saw or heard him choke. I've never eaten popcorn again. Well, this one was horrifying for a whole other reason, huh? I'm glad I went to the theater yesterday, or I absolutely would not have gotten popcorn. What an awful, horrific way to die. Ah, I don't want to think about it anymore. Anyway, if you've made it this far, I'm assuming you are less disturbed by these than me, and so I hope you enjoyed or learned something or whatever. As for me, I'm out of here. I do hope you have a wonderful day or night wherever you are, though, and I'll see you in the next one.